Tonight we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the subject of, of destiny by talking about uh, the importance of staying on course and how do we stay on course if God has a, a planned route for us to take to get to a desired destination then how do we stay on that that course without getting bumped off or uh, wandering off or, or going astray uh, We've got different things that God has blessed us with and things that he's given to us. And if we will allow those things to work, if we'll make sure that they're functioning, they, they will help us. Uh, how many have smoke detectors in their home? Everybody, I hope. If you don't, go home and put one in. Or we'll get one for you and put it in for you. Uh, how many of you check the batteries on your smoke detectors? Uh, don't you hate it when those things go off? Man, oh man. And I, I especially hate it when it's uh, in a, a smoke detector that's too, it's too high for me to get to without getting a ladder. Uh, I got some that I have to get a step ladder and I got to crawl up there. And I used to have them where if one went off, they would all start buzzing and beeping at the same time. And, uh, and, and they only work if, if they're enabled to work. And if they're not enabled to work, they have no battery or, or they're just not there, not installed, then they can't help you. They can't warn you. So you, you have to make sure that, that that is a part of, you know, your, your, your home life, that you have a functioning smoke detector. And many times you'll hear of tragedies, terrible tragedies, and they'll investigate afterward, and they will come out with things like, uh, like this. They'll say, well, somebody disabled the smoke detector. It's against the law to do that on an airplane, isn't it? And uh, it's, against, it's a federal law. You can't disable a smoke detector on an airplane. How many of you ever use GPS? We were talking about this the other day, how much that has freed us up to just fearlessly go where no man has ever gone before. <laughs> and I, I enjoy going places loud like I, I, I never did. Uh, and can you remember the old days when... You had the, the little map that you had to unfold, you know, and sometimes it'd fly out the window. And, uh, and then the atlas, everybody, I wonder whatever happened to those companies that printed up those atlases. They, they went broke. And, and, and we used to have to look at that. I remember times, you know, just getting so frustrated because I'd be driving and, and I'd hand the map over to my wife. I'd say, here, you, you, uh, I'm driving, you, you look at it and see. And she would just like hand it back, you know. <laughs> Like, I don't know. I don't know where we are. I don't know how to, I don't like, she just was not a map reader. But, but if you have a GPS system in your, in your, on your phone or if you have something in your car, uh, the only way that it works is if you enable it to work. And if you disable it, it won't function. So we have to enable the systems that God has given to us. And we have to keep them functional or we're going to get off course. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. I think it's interesting that those things are, are they're, they're put together or placed together in, in, this, in this passage that we just read. You'll see how going astray or turning your own way is linked to the word iniquity. Um, iniquity is just a, a twisting in our, in our character. It's just, uh, it's a, a perverseness, uh, a, a bent. It's like we're, we're bent in, in, our, in our character, in our flesh. Uh, and and we, we have this constant tendency to get off course. It's just there with all of us. And even after we get saved, we still have to really watch out for that. We have to ask God to help us so that that iniquity drive, which wants to pull us off course and take us in a different direction toward a different destination, we have to make sure that that is frustrated and that God is not, that he is pleased and, and iniquity is, is always mad at us. It's always, it's always hating us because we're never allowing it to drive us off course and make us go astray. As hard as it fights, as hard as it pushes, greater is he that is in us than any kind of iniquity drive that would try to force us to get lost. So we do not have to lose our way. We do not. But, but every one of us 
is prone to do that. Every one of us was lost until we came into contact with Jesus Christ, who is the way and the truth and the life. Amen? Amen. And I'm going to give you these guidance systems and talk about them just briefly, and we'll get through as many of them as we can in the next few minutes. The first one is your conscience. Romans chapter 1 talks about the fact that man was basically just turned over uh, and turned over and turned over to do this and to do that because his conscience was deadened. And the Bible says that God has given to each one of us a conscience. But then we need to have our conscience purified after we come to Christ because it gets defiled. It gets disabled. Uh, it doesn't work very well. People that don't have a working conscience are called sociopaths. Uh, one out of 25 individuals could be diagnosed clinically as a sociopath, a person who just does not have a working conscience. Uh, they do not feel guilt. They do not feel remorse. They know what it looks like from watching it acted out on television and in movies, but they themselves don't actually feel it. They don't actually experience that. Their conscience just simply is so broken and so disabled that it does not work. Then all of us have some of these sociopathic tendencies where we will do things and it will seem like for whatever reason we turned our conscience off so we could do it. We flipped the switch and disabled the conscience because our conscience was getting in the way of something that our flesh wanted us to do. And so we shut it off for a moment. This is why you never want to be under the influence of things. This is why even just casual social drinking can cause a person to switch off their conscience just for a moment and then do things that are unconscionable. Things that they would say, well, man, I would never do that if I hadn't been under the influence of those drugs or under the influence of marijuana or under the influence of even some kind of a prescription thing. I would never have done that. But, but it seems like that person has had a momentary lapse of conscious, uh, conscience, not consciousness. They're wide awake, but their conscience just simply is not working. The Bible says, now the Spirit exp expressly says that in the latter times, in the last days, some will depart from the faith. They will go astray. They will get off course, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. It's like a cauterization that takes place. You know, when there's bleeding, a surgeon will go in and they'll cauterize the, the blood vessels by just simply uh, burning them and then they close and, and the bleeding stops. A seared conscience is the same kind of thing. It's working, it's flowing, it's functioning, and then it gets disabled. And sin acts as that hot iron that sears our conscience. And the more you sear it and the more you burn it, the less it works. And you can turn your conscience off and turn it back on and turn it off and turn it back on and enable it and disable it. And the conscience is a gift from God that helps us to be able to really hear a voice other than our own speaking to us and either justifying us and saying, that was good, or accusing us and saying, that wasn't good and you know it. That wasn't the right thing to do and you know it. I thank God for a sensitive conscience. I don't want my conscience to become seared and dysfunctional. I don't want to abuse it so that it, it, it becomes disabled and can no longer help me. It can no longer work for me and for my good. And the, the conscience is a tremendous gift. And there are people that actually um, just abuse it so badly that it just simply does not work anymore. And uh, sometimes people kind of confuse uh, quenching the spirit and searing the conscience. The Holy Spirit and your conscience are not the same thing. And so they're two different, two different, two different things. The Holy Spirit is, is God, and the Holy Spirit is, is, is person. Um, the conscience is something that God has given to us that is a moral compass. It's something that has a voice that speaks to us, and God can use that. He uses that as a, as a, a repository for good things, and our conscience knows what's right, and we instinctively know what's right, and God has blessed us with that because prior to you getting baptized in the Holy Spirit, you needed something that God could use in order to help you, or you would have been a maniac. Amen? Your parents never could have 
never could have taught you anything. And so your conscience then became a tutor that would lead you, help lead you to Christ. And then the Holy Spirit then would become the principal voice of God speaking into your life and speaking direction into your life. So they're two different things. But the, the conscience cannot be disabled. How is your conscience working tonight? When you do bad things, do you feel bad about it? When you do bad things, are you reminded of it and forced to deal with it? Or can you just push it out of the way and just move on with your life and act like it never happened? And there are people that have a conscience that just simply does not, it does not work. It's been disabled and, and it needs to be enabled. God needs to do a work in that person's life to begin to restore unto them a sense of what is right and what is wrong. And uh, uh, that, that is not an act that, you know, in other words, you'd say, well, Pastor, I'm going to come up after the service is over and you're going to lay hands on me and pray and all of a sudden my conscience is going to start to work. And it's, it's a product of, of God working in our lives. When we get back to God, God begins to restore all things. When we open our hearts to the Lord in faith, those things which are broken and those things which are diseased God begins to move in and he starts to heal. And, and, and one of the ways that you know that something's happening is if you're able to live in sin and enjoy it, and then all of a sudden, under the, the, the Bible says that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, and the word of God is able to penetrate even a dead conscience, a disabled conscience, and many times the first time a person in a long time has a sense of right and wrong is when they're sitting at a meeting like this and the Holy Spirit begins to break through and they start to feel uncomfortable and they start to feel a sense of, uh, of godly sorrow for their sins and a sense of holy fear that there is a righteous judge that they will stand before and that's the very first step toward that conscience being restored to its proper place in function in your life. And once that happens, a person, once they get saved and give their heart to Christ, after that initial experience with conviction, the convicting power of the Holy Ghost, then, then from that moment on, that conscience begins to work. And coupled with God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit and the other things I'm going to talk about tonight, that individual is ruined for sinning. You can still do it. And you may still do it. But you won't like it like you used to. Amen? Amen? Because your conscience is working. And, uh, and it is guiding you and keeping you on course. And when you get off course, your conscience lets you know. Amen? How many want a conscience that will let them know when they start to go astray? Hey, you're going astray here. How many of you have ever argued with your conscience? And defended yourself to your conscience? Well, I'm not so bad. Well, that wasn't really... Well, it wasn't really... Do you ever win those arguments? I've never won one of those arguments, ever. I've argued with my conscience for weeks sometimes, and I've lost every argument with my conscience. My conscience has always been right. It's always had a true north compass that knows exactly what's what, and when I stray off of that, even a degree, my conscience doesn't like it, and my conscience is sensitive to it. Praise God for a sensitive conscience. Let's just stop right now and ask God to sharpen and sensitize our conscience. Amen? Just say that with me. Oh, God. In the name of Jesus, sharpen and sensitize my conscience. Activate it. Activate it in Jesus' name. Amen. And the next one is God's Word. The Bible says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So God's given us a system that, that when it's enabled, it will keep us on course. It will keep us on course. Many times people involved in prophetic ministry have a misunderstanding about what it means and what it is, and they will try to model themselves after Old Testament prophets that God was sending repeatedly to Israel to rebuke them and to uh, prophesy judgment against them, to warn them of the wrath of God that was going to come, uh, to talk about how disaster was going to come, famine was going to come because of their sins, and you know they better straighten up or they were going to experience some pretty horrible things. And one of the things that we, we help people with is to train them that, that the New Testament model for prophetic ministry involves exhortation, it in, involves encouragement, it involves comfort, but the Bible says that it's the Word of God that we use to bring correction. The Word of God is the thing that will correct our course 
if an individual is off course, if they're sitting under the preaching or the teaching of the Word of God, or they're just simply in their living room or in a, in a quiet place of their choosing, reading the Word of God, the Word of God is living and active, as I said earlier, and sharper than a two-edged sword, and it will begin to convict us of sin, and it will begin to show us that we've been off in some area of our lives. We haven't been handling our business properly. We haven't been treating people right. We haven't been approaching life the way that we're called to approach life. We haven't understood this. We haven't understood that. Our thinking is, is off, and we need to get over here and line it up with what God's Word says. That's why we need to, every single one of us, be daily in the Word of God. And if you can't make a plan of your own, get a one-year Bible and you'll have a daily Bible reading plan. Get that thing. You've got to have, you can't afford to go four or five days, and, and would, you, would you go on a trip and go for four or five days and just not check to see if you were on course? Not, not check to see if you were still on track? Not pay any attention to the roads that you were on or the numbers of the roads or the, the north, south, east, west direction that you were traveling in. And just say, oh, I'm just going to travel four or five days and just, you know, just kind of wander around. If you needed to get somewhere or you had a destination in mind, you would want to check every single day. When you have the GPS functioning on your dashboard or on your phone, you, you check it and refer to it moment by moment, don't you, when you're traveling down the interstate or when you're going someplace. You just, I'm constantly looking to see, well, it'll be this X number of miles, this is how fast I'm going, this is the speed limit, all the information, I'm checking my gauges, you know, I want to see where I'm at. I like to just watch the little arrow move and what up those, isn't that cool how that happens? It's just very entertaining, and I enjoy watching that, and I check, I check it all the time. And the, and the Word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, and it's the thing that we keep in front of us, and we're just checking. How's my attitude? How am I doing spiritually? Am I living a life that's pleasing to God? Am I keeping God's commandments? And do I understand what the will of God is? And do, am I putting faith and confidence in the word of God and living by that word and, and standing on it as a solid rock? And so the word of God then becomes the thing that we, if we'll enable it, it will keep us on course. And one of the things in church life that, that happens is that... Uh, We've got classes for this and classes for that, and we've got this kind of fellowship and this kind of meeting and that kind of meeting, and all of the meetings are, are, are good. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being here tonight. I mean, it's good for us to be here tonight, but, but if this is the only word that we're going to get for the rest of the week, it's not enough to keep the average Christian on course at all. It's not going to keep you on course as a mom or as a dad or as a, uh, you know, a man or a woman or a, a student or a young person. It's just not enough. It's not, it's not going to be enough for you to be able to stay on track and stay on course. You're going to have to get the Word of God into your system and live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. And it's just something that, that we want to do because you don't want to go, to go astray, do you? I don't think anybody wants to go astray. I don't think anybody wants to let iniquity overwhelm them and pull them off course. Um, it's, it's, just, it's, just, uh, it's just not something that, if we think about it, is, is even imaginable. You, you just, you don't want to end up in the wrong place. You don't want to finish your life and not be where you're supposed to be. And, and you don't want to wander around. You don't, I don't have time for that. And the Word of God will keep me locked on step by step. It's a lamp unto my feet. It's a light unto my path. Not only am I going to be able to look at the Word of God and see what my next step is, but I'm also going to be able to see what some of the points are out there in the distance that I'm aiming for. So I'm, I'm looking at my feet, it's a lamp unto my feet, but then it also lights up the path so I can see further ahead. And I keep the Word of God as a constant reference point and check myself according to the Word of God. How am I doing according to the Scriptures? And uh, that is one of the things that gets disabled by just simply collecting dust. We just disable it when we don't pick it up. It's, it's disabled and turned off when we never crack the book and when we never approach it seriously and when it isn't a major part of our walk with God. And I just know that for years, um, you know, there were, there were seasons in my life when I was very sporadic with the Word. When I first got saved, I ate it like there was no tomorrow. I just consumed it. And, uh, and then, you know, went through a period when I was in college where I just kind of backed off of it a little bit. I mean, I was familiar with it, I read it, but I was not consistent with it. And, uh, and I just know that, that that can happen in a person's life. 
and nobody's condemning anybody if they're not reading the Bible. We're just giving you the benefits of having that guidance system functioning and operative in your life. Don't disable it, because if you do, you will get off course, and, um, and then that will be bad for you. And, and that will be bad for everybody connected to you, because then all kinds of difficulty will arise from that. And uh, none of us have time to mess with that kind of stuff. Nobody wants that for their life. And so the Word of God has been made available to us to help us so that that doesn't happen. The next thing is prayer. The Bible says, Then he came to the disciples, and he found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so because they didn't pray, what happened to the disciples when the pressure really became intense later on that evening? They went astray, didn't they? They went astray. Get a hold of the shepherd and then scatter the sheep. The Bible says they all just ran in, in different directions and they scattered and got off course and got off track. Every single one of them had that experience. And Jesus was not prophesying that it would happen or you know, wanting it to happen. He was warning them that this is what happens when we don't pray. And when we don't pray, the pressure is going to come. And uh, all of us have experienced pressure in life, intense pressure. Uh, you've been through health issues. Maybe you've had a, a marital crisis or a divorce. Uh, you've had issues where uh, things have, have uh, just suddenly changed in your life in terms of maybe your employment, uh, your finances, different things that have happened. And in a, if we only pray after the crisis has already hit, by then it's too late. I'm sure as Peter was running away, he was probably praying. <laughs> You know, I, I'm sure that they were all praying. They were all kind of shooting up prayers to God, but their prayers were, were panic prayers. Oh, God, don't let them catch me, which had absolutely nothing to do with what was happening. And you know, in a crisis, we always make everything about us. We always make everything about us and everything about how we feel about it and everything about how afraid we are that, that now something bad is going to happen to us. And, and we don't see the big picture. We forget everything that God has ever said to us. And so the time to have prayed would have been prior to that incident where they came to arrest Jesus. What would have happened? How would they have reacted if they had been able to pray and if they had been men who understood how to do that instead of falling asleep? The Bible says that we're all willing to pray. Are you willing to pray? Of course you're willing to pray. I'm willing to pray too. But if we were honest, we would say, well, my flesh is pretty weak. My flesh is pretty weak. You know, in that particular area... It seems like I don't pray as much as I ought to pray. I read an interesting article of a pastor who is uh, turning the leadership responsibility of the church over to a younger man, and uh, he's transitioning, and, and he's going to go into more of an apostolic role with uh, mentoring young leaders and coaching them and being free to be able to impact more than just one church. And they asked him, well, what would you do over again? Is there anything that you would do differently if you had it to do over again now that you've reached this point in your ministry career. And he said, of course, this is going to seem like a cliche, and the younger guys, I can see them rolling their eyes and all saying, yeah, sure, he would say that. But you know what he said? He said, I would, I would say, pray. Pray more. If you're praying, pray more than you're praying. He said, if I had it to do over again, I would pray more. He said, I did not pray enough. He said, I see that now. I realize it now. I'm doing something about it now. But I, but I would have been better off had I, had I addressed this issue and, and done more to pray when I was younger. It would have been better for everybody, uh, better for everybody that sat under my ministry. I would have been a better leader. Things would have been different if I had prayed more. So praying is something that we can't just keep hearing about it all the time. At some point, we have to start making some concrete steps and just do whatever you need to do to get yourself up and, and praying. You figure it out. I've had to figure it out. I have no sympathy for you whatsoever. You, you have to figure it out for yourself. I, I mean, God had to help me with that. Nobody else could hold my hand. And, I mean, I just had to figure it out and just, okay, this is, this is what I'm going to do. And I, I'll just tell you, I have, I have discovered in, in just even the last probably 10 years of my life just a joy in praying that I would never have thought was possible. And, uh, but I can tell you, for me personally, and I don't know how it's going to work for you, but I don't instantly just get into the spirit of prayer. 
It just does not happen to me instantly. But, but it, it, all of a sudden, it just, and I can't tell you exactly when it comes, because it'll vary, but, but it will just hit me after I, through just sheer obedience, I just push through and I just pray. And I just make myself do it. And the best way for me to make myself do it is for me to set a timer. And I just set a timer. Then the decision is already made. I just know that, God, I'm going to give you um, a, this chunk of time. And I found that during this season when I was home and I, I couldn't go anywhere much, and that I would, I would set my phone for 15-minute increments of prayer. And, uh, and then I would pray for 15 minutes. And I, I didn't want to overexert myself. I was supposed to kind of take it easy. And I didn't want to get too excited. Or, or I move around when I pray. I walk back and forth when I pray. I don't kneel. If you kneel, I think kneeling is a recipe for, I think that if the Lord shows up, then I'll kneel <laughs> and fall on my face before the Lord. But if, but if I'm going to really be fervent in prayer, I have to exercise my body at the same time that I'm exercising my spirit. So I have to move. So I have to have a place where I can do that. But I just find that as I do that, that uh, even those little 15-minute increments, I'd pray for 15 minutes, and then, and then I would... Uh, by the end of 15 minutes, then it was almost like within 15 minutes, that spirit of prayer would come on me. And then I would set it for, okay, I'll do another 15 minutes. And then I would do another 15 minutes. And then I would do another 15 minutes. And I just kept adding 15 minutes, and I just kept going because I couldn't stop. I thought, well, I can't stop now. I mean, I have just, I'm not even hardly getting started in 15 minutes. But, but if you look at this, and I'm saying all of this to just share with you my own personal experience, because some of you have never prayed for 15 minutes in your life. So when you look at this and you think, well, God wants me to pray for an hour. I have to pray for an hour. And you just think, how in the world am I going to pray for an hour? There have been times when I've had small groups of people and I say, okay, we're going to pray in tongues now for 10 minutes. We're going to pray in tongues for 10 minutes. And people that do not have their spiritual muscles exercised to pray for 10 minutes in tongues, it's absolutely the longest 10 minutes that they have ever experienced in their life. It's like, how, do you, how in the world do you do that? Because for most people, it's about 15 seconds. It's almost, like, it's almost like they can pray as long as they can hold their breath, you know, for like two minutes, and then they're done. It's like, <gasps> and then they're gasping for breath. And, oh, boy, I'm glad that's over. But, but if you'll start, and if you can't pray for 15 minutes, I think it would be good if you're just getting started, and this is new to you. I would, just, I would just encourage you to, even tonight before you go to bed, set, set a timer on your phone or something for five minutes and just pray for five minutes. And if you're not used to praying, five minutes is going to seem like five hours. I mean, it is. You're just going to say, I'm, I can't even think of anything else to pray. Bless mom, bless dad, bless the cat, bless the dog, bless me, bless, you know, I don't know what else to pray. I mean, five, I got to do this for five minutes? And uh, if we were just to all sit here for five minutes, you'd see how long five minutes was. And you'd think, well, that is a long time. That's a long time. So start with five minutes. I know everybody can do at least that. And then, and then just challenge yourself and just see how you do. Just say, okay, I'm going to do it for five minutes. Do it for five minutes consistently. But stop and do it. Don't just do it while you're driving. Don't just do it while you're running around getting ready in the morning. Just make, make yourself stop and just say, for five minutes now, this is what I'm going to do. And then after that, I get to go ahead and brush my teeth or go ahead and eat my cereal or whatever or go ahead and get in the car and go to work. But I'm going to take five minutes and I'm going to pray. Begin with that and, 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 and start exercising prayer because it will keep you on track in ways that you cannot even imagine. And, and I, it's, it's supernatural. And the person who is naturally minded thinks that it doesn't matter. But that's only because they're naturally minded. God works through prayer supernaturally. It's a spiritual thing that he gifts us with that can only be understood, it can only be experienced if we approach it in faith. Amen? Amen. But if we pray by faith, believing, God will begin to order our steps and he'll begin to speak to us. And I'm telling you that once you start, I cannot pray for 15 minutes without grabbing my iPad and writing down things that God is saying to me. I just can't do it. All of a sudden, it's just like, I wasn't thinking about that. I would have never thought of that in a million years, but I'm just getting stuff, and, and I, will spend, I will spend time not only praying, but also just 
writing down what I'm hearing. And I don't know why I'm hearing it, and I don't know what it's for, I don't know who it's for, sometimes it's for me, sometimes it's just stuff. And I'll just write it down. And I'll look at it later. And uh, the Bible talks about how a righteous man will pull things out of the treasure chest of, of his heart or her heart, things that are new and things that are old. And where, where does that stuff come from? I think a lot of the treasure comes as a result of prayer. God begins to deposit treasure in us as we stop and pray and seek the Lord. But prayer will keep you on course. What time is it now, Pastor Mason? Do you know? Okay, it's 8.01. So I'm going to do one more and then I'm going to stop. Are you, are you okay? Okay. So what did we talk about first? We talked about the conscience. Don't, just don't, uh, just value your conscience. Don't, don't, um, don't damage it. You know, don't, don't burn it. And uh, don't disable it. You know, don't take the batteries out of it. Because it's like a smoke detector. It'll warn you. Um, it's, it's like your GPS that will guide you. Say, stay, you're, you're getting off. You know, you're starting to get a little ugly here. Get back on track. Get back where you need to be. And then the next one was God's word. And the next one was prayer. And then the next one is shepherds. Um, because the scripture that we read from Isaiah says that all we like sheep have gone astray. And so the Bible talks about how God has given shepherds to his people. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and the Bible tells us that, uh, that uh, there are ministry gifts that are responsible for shepherding the people of God so that they'll be able to, they'll be able to go where they need to go. They'll, they'll have the leadership that they need to, to bring them into the things that God has for them. And I think that's one of the things that is probably... Uh, Always, I think it's always been a, a difficult thing for people to accept or for people to grasp, and it's been hard for me, uh, difficult for me to be able to uh, sometimes get around some of the faults that I've seen in leaders, some of the uh, things that have happened to me. I saw a little podcast today that kind of grieved me, and it was a woman that was talking about, uh, oh, seven signs that your pastor is an abuser. And uh, the more I listened to her, the more I just was grieved because I just felt like this person is... You know, they're out there, but there's the words that they're saying are not lies. The things that they're pointing out, the points that they're making are not necessarily untrue, but, but they're, what's riding on her words is a wounded person, uh, uh, an offended person. And uh, so it's tainting, you know, what she's saying. And, uh, and, and it's, it's kind of, uh, I just got the feeling that, that uh, people that were listening to this are being exposed to something that's not going to make them healthy. It's not going to inoculate them. It's not an, an antidote. It's almost like they're being infected. They're being infected with offense. They're being infected with, wo with woundedness and uh, suspicion and mistrust and disrespect and, and uh, all different kinds of things. And I, I listened to that and it, it kind of hurt me a little bit because I, I, ha I have, just like everybody else, um, been subject to leaders my whole life and been around leaders my whole life, and been at the mercy of leaders my whole life. And, and so the challenge is there. I don't, I don't fault anybody for having you know, hurt feelings or for struggling or for having problems, but I just know that the devil would like to separate the sheep from the shepherds. And we have to remember the promise that, that we have in the, in the Old Testament that God will raise up shepherds after his own heart. And uh, so sometimes there are these broad brush labeling, <coughs> excuse me, labelings, that take place and sometimes there are things that uh, are misunderstood and uh, someone based on their past experience will hear something or see something and leap to a judgment that is unrighteous. It's an unrighteous judgment. That's not who that leader is. They're ju they just said something and it reminded you of somebody else who wasn't a good leader and so now all of a sudden you've slapped that label on them and now you're going to cause trouble. Now you're going Now you're going to have trouble yourself. <clears throat> so, here's what the Bible says. I'll take one of them, yeah. Have you got one? All of a sudden, I got a tickle. Mm. I'm good. I'll just, I'll hold on to it here and I'll probably spill it. <laughs> so, the Bible says, remember your leaders, for it was they who brought you the word of God, and consider the result of their conduct, the outcome of their godly lives, and imitate their faith, their conviction that God exists and is the creator and ruler of all things, the provider of eternal salvation through Christ, and imitate their reliance on God with absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness. 
And so the Bible says that we should remember them. We should, um, we should look to our, our spiritual leaders, the shepherds that God has placed over us, and have confidence that God is using them to get us to where we're destined to, to be. That we're not going to get there without them. And we're not just going to be able to wander off the path. If, if that happens, you'll be like the lost sheep in the Bible. The parable of the lost sheep where Jesus said there were 99 that were in the fold, but there was one lost sheep, and then the shepherd had to go out and try to find that one lost sheep that had wandered off. And, and as tempting as it is to wander off and be independent and go your own way, <coughs> and as difficult as it is sometimes to understand what leaders are thinking and why they're doing what they're doing, we have to, we have to approach uh, following leaders uh, by faith just like we do everything else. Amen? Amen. And, and do it prayerfully and trust God and believe God. Now, when I say that, I also want to warn you that there are false shepherds out there and false apostles and false prophets and false teachers and they're out there. And uh, this woman that I told you I was listening to today, she's not wrong in, in pointing out some of the things that are signs or marks of a person who is going to lead people astray. And leaders can do that. And they can lead a whole group of folks astray. Uh, and the, the examples are legion. So many that we can bring up some famous ones. A lot of the younger people don't, don't know the name Jim Jones. Uh, they, they don't remember Jonestown. And I was in college, you know, when the pictures came over, uh, you know, from Guyana. And, and the nightly news was full of pictures of, of, uh, of people that had drunk Kool-Aid. And uh, 900 people plus uh, out there in the jungle. And they were led astray by, by a charismatic leader. And they just followed him blindly. And uh, one of the things we have to constantly remember is that, that uh, the leaders we want to follow are the leaders that are following Christ. Amen. And the Apostle Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. If I go astray and stop following Christ, then you have my permission to stop following me. Amen. Don't follow me. If I go astray, don't follow me. Because I'm off. I'm off the track. That's why everybody needs to pray. Everybody needs to read their Bible. Everybody needs to be sensitive to what's right and wrong. <clears throat> Amen? Amen? So here's what the scripture says. My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. Why are they lost? They're lost because they were led astray by their own shepherds. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. Oftentimes, leaders will lead their congregations astray by getting into politics. And they'll begin to preach politics from the pulpit. Uh, they'll lead them astray because they'll get into some uh, extreme of doctrine. And, and they will not teach and preach the whole counsel of God. And they'll lead their people astray. Sometimes leaders will lead their people astray for financial gain. And they'll lead them off the track because there's the promise for the leader of some kind of financial benefit. And so they're not really following God or following the Holy Spirit's direction. They're following the money. And that's what they're following. All different kinds of ways that people can be led astray by leaders. People can get off in, in, in so many ways. And when leaders get off, it's especially tragic because they have followers. They have followers. And uh, so shepherds will help us, though. And I don't want to live my life and, and refuse to live my life without having relationships with apostolic leaders who can help me stay on track. Amen? Amen? I want to be connected with people that I respect so much that the thought of getting off the track would be so uh, anathema to me. I would, just, I, would, I would just think, man, I would just die of embarrassment if, if I did something stupid and then I had, to, I had to answer to this guy or I had to answer to that person or I had to face this one. I just... I don't think I could stand that. I, I, I have good standing with them, and I want to keep myself in good standing with them. And oftentimes, we overestimate, we judge people in ways that we would never judge ourselves because we say, well, pastors should just, they should just do it because, you know, they should just do it because they fear God, or they should just do it because they have to answer to God. And uh, that's true, and you're exactly right about that. But let me, let me ask you this. Are there things that, that you would not do, that you might be tempted to do because there is some flesh and blood person that is right beside you that you care about and you know you would hurt their feelings and break their heart, 
Does not that relationship help you to stay on track? It sure does. Amen? So all of us need to fear God, and we all need to know we're going to answer to Him. But then all of us need to follow <coughs> leaders with the understanding that we want to develop good relationships with them, and we want to be the type of, of, of people as we follow them that, that will uh, just build their confidence to lead strongly and let them know that, uh, Pastor, you follow the Lord, and we are right behind you. Wherever he leads you, we will, we will we'll follow you. And uh, we, want, we want to get where we're supposed to go. We believe God's called us to be under your authority, under your leadership, under your, under your teaching. And, uh, and we've got confidence in that and confidence in God and faith to follow you all the way. And I just thank God for the way that he's helped to keep us on course. Aren't you grateful for that? I mean, I'm just grateful that in all these years, 26 years that we've been here, with all the opportunities that we've had uh, to get off the track and, and all the times that maybe we kind of maybe got off into a little extreme of doctrine or we kind of got influenced by maybe a little movement that really wasn't right. God has been gracious and faithful to always get us back on track and keep us in relationship with healthy leaders that have helped us to be able to, to get out of the woods and uh, get off the bunny trails, you know, that, that we might have rabbit trails that we might have chased down and get back on the path of righteousness, the right path that God has for us. Amen? And, uh, of course, the goal is to do that all the way through. Amen? Is to do it all the way through. And uh, when I see people that disable their conscience, I know that they're going to get in trouble. When sin no longer bothers them, when they no longer are embarrassed um, by, by sin, it, it's, it's, it's not a problem, then, then I, I fear for them because I know that they're going to get off the track. That's just going to happen. When a person gets away from the Word of God and the Word of God no longer is the rule, it's no longer the... the, the the, the straight edge for their life, then I know that they're going to get lost. Eventually, they're going to go astray. When people stop praying, that's going to happen. One of my good friends in the ministry was part of a huge ministry in another state, and he said when they began to get off the track, uh, it was right at the time that they began to pray less and less and less. And the bigger the church got and the more money came in, the less they prayed. When the church was smaller, when the church was challenged, when they were trying to achieve goals and they needed God's help, they prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And then when they got all these blessings, they quit praying, and that was the moment, you could just mark it down, that they began to get off the track and they began to go in the wrong direction. And then you'll see people also that will just simply say, I'm not going to listen to anybody. I don't need any pastor. I, Jesus is my pastor. Well, I'm worried about you. Yeah, if Jesus, is your, if Jesus is the only shepherd that you have, then, uh, then, then you're missing something. And uh, the Bible says that he was the one that took captivity captive and gave gifts to men. And these are ministry gifts, leadership gifts, and they're given to us for a reason because all we like sheep tend to go astray. But the Lord has placed that iniquity on Jesus so that its curse could be broken and instead of going astray, we could get on course and stay on course. And uh, God's enablement is more than enough. Unless we begin systematically to disable what he has given to us. So we can't do it, can we? We have to make sure these things are protected. We have to make sure that these things are functional in our lives. Amen? I've got some more and maybe I'll hit those next Wednesday. Is that okay? All right, good. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to bless us now in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for all the great things that you've given to us. And there, there's so much more than what I was able to talk about tonight. But we give you thanks and we receive these good things. Thank you for a conscience that can be pure and clean and healthy and functional. Thank you for that. Lord, we appreciate it. Sometimes we don't like what our conscience tells us about ourselves, but we know it never lies. And so we thank you, Lord, for a healthy, functional conscience in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for the word of God that's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Forgive us for ignoring it. Forgive us for neglecting it. Forgive us, Lord, for just simply disabling the word of God in our lives by not picking up the Bible, not meditating on the scripture, being too busy, too distracted, doing other things. Lord, we thank you that you begin to help us now to get into the word of God systematically. Get a one-year Bible if we need to and begin to read the Word of God. Read the Word of God. 
Lord, we thank you for prayer. And we thank you, Lord, that you teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray. Just get us started. We're just like children. Lord, we have a short attention span. But Lord, if you can just get us going, uh, we'll grow in this area. And we'll go from five minutes to 10 minutes to 15 minutes. Pretty soon, we'll be waiting in your presence for an hour. And Lord, we thank you that you strengthen us in this area and make River of Life a much stronger church in the area of prayer than it is today. And Lord, we thank you for good shepherds. We thank you for the ability to discern between the good ones and the not so good ones. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless us. Bless us with great leaders, great shepherds. Oh God, in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, that as they follow Christ, we can safely and confidently follow them without fear of going astray. So we thank you for strengthening our faith tonight and blessing us, oh God, to think about these things and meditate on them and make them a part of our lives. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Praise God. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. So on Sunday, when we come back here on Sunday, we're going to talk some more about destiny. And we started on that on, on Sunday morning, but we're going to talk some more about that. And, uh, and I'm going to kind of, t the word that I, that I got from the Lord on that has to do with, uh, with uh, oh, I just heard like um, when somebody's doing really well and they're, and, they're, and they're moving in the direction that they're supposed to move in, um, we will say like that person's really on track. You know, or companies will say that person is on track to break all the sales records. They're on track. And people get, get excited when people are on track. They're on track. And uh, so we're going to talk about, you know, uh, the need and, 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 the, and the wonderful blessing that God has for each one of us to be on track. We're on track. And then to ask ourselves, am I on track or am I off track? And then if I get, if I get off track, how do I get back on? And because uh, all of us, every single person, you know, needs to be on track. Nobody can afford not to be. Amen? And, and we, want, we want all of the angels in heaven to be just, uh, you know, uh, cheering and all the witnesses in heaven cheering. And, we, and what do we want? I, what I want them to be saying is, you know, Chris is on track. He's on track. Look at that old guy. He's on track. Look at him go. You know, that's what I want them to say. And, uh, and that's what you want the witnesses that are, that are, are, are yours to be saying as well, that, that you're on track. You're not off track. You're not stuck out in the weeds somewhere, but you're on track. I'm kind of preaching that sermon right now, so some of you won't even have to come. <laughs> but it'll be better on Sunday. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Okay. Um, if you need an offering envelope, then uh, the ushers have them. And we'll go ahead and, and, uh, and pass those out. Pastor Miriam comes back on Sunday. She'll be back in town at, at 2 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. So she had a great meeting last night with the ladies there. Uh, and uh, they had 60 women. And uh, so they were really excited about that. And uh, for, the, for the church there right now, 60 is a really out, outstanding number. My sister-in-law, Leah, was hoping for 40. And so they had 60. So they were just thrilled. And then it had a terrific, just a great meeting. And uh, my, my, uh, my wife told me last night, she said it just felt like there was just like a revival atmosphere in the room, just like, just, it reminded me of when I was a kid and uh, how you just felt like anything could happen. You know, God is just moving and anything could happen. And it was an awesome revival atmosphere there. So she was super excited about, about the meeting and she'll be back on, on Sunday. Amen. Thanks for praying for me. Keep praying for me. My retinas are still right where they're supposed to be. And uh, had a good checkup on Monday. And I'm seeing 2025 out of this eye, uh, the left eye that just had the surgery. So I'm really thankful for that. I still got a bubble uh, bouncing around in there and uh, a lot of reflected light off that bubble that's real distracting. But uh, every, every day it seems like I'm getting better and I just have to tell myself to just take it easy. Like during the praise and worship, man, I just want to go, but I just can't. And, uh, and uh, the, the doctor told me I couldn't run, which I'm not going to do anyway. And uh, unless you have a weapon, I'm not running. I'm not running. And, uh, and I couldn't play tennis. And all of a sudden, I, when he said that, I just had this picture of me wearing these, like, tight white shorts. <laughs> like, like John McEnroe wore back in the day, you know, like the real tight short ones, like really, like, kind of obscene ones. And I just said, man, no way. 
I'm not going to play tennis now, ever. I did, I've never played tennis, and I'm not going to play. So don't worry. So I just have to kind of take it easy. But uh, praise God, everything's going, going really well, and I'm, I'm really grateful. Amen? So tonight, you know, uh, if you want to buy a chair tonight, it's, it's, uh, we're holding firm on that price. It's still 60 bucks. That price is not going to go up. And uh, if you want to buy a chair, buy a chair. And, uh, and uh, if you want to start contributing to your parking spot, you know, just do it tonight. And I want to encourage everybody to, to give. And uh, we're going to push this thing through. And now's not the time to coast. Now's the time to press in and lean forward and, and go hard until we break the tape. Amen? Amen. And uh, we'll, we'll be done when we're done. But until we're done, we all have to go as hard as we can go. So thank you for doing that. And uh, if you haven't started, then get started. If you've been doing it, don't be discouraged. Let's keep going. Uh, we're going to reap if we don't grow weary and faint. Amen? In due season, we're going to reap a great harvest. And uh, I'm looking forward to that in the days ahead. Amen? Amen? Praise God. Well, let's stand and we'll pray and be dismissed. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for healing everybody that needs healing tonight. And Lord, we pray that everybody would experience a touch from God. Lord, that you would deliver every person from hurts and wounds, emotional things and mental problems and things like that that tend to plague us and fears and insecurities. Lord, we pray for people that aren't here tonight because they, uh, they couldn't make it for whatever reason. And we pray, Lord, that you would touch them and bless them. We pray, Lord, for Pastor James and Crystal and Virginia, and we ask you to grow the church there, bless the church. Lord, we thank you for touching them. We pray that you'd protect them and deliver them from evil supply all of their needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Father, we pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done in the local church there as they put it in, in motion and, and, and lay a foundation, Lord, for a great work. We thank you, Lord, for touching all of the members there and blessing them, encouraging them. Lord, we thank you for every good thing that you've done for us today, all the ways in which, Lord, you've protected us, whether we realized it or not, all the ways that you've shown us favor. And we pray, Lord, that we would return thanks now in such a way that it would free up even more favor and that our gratitude would trigger even more blessings, Lord, as we honestly tell you how, how thankful we are for everything that you're doing and all the things that you're working out and all the ways in which you've gone ahead of us into our future to make a way for us. Lord, we thank you that you're already there. Uh, you're already standing way out there having prepared each step of the way for us so no weapon formed against us can prosper Nothing can stop us from getting to where we're called to go. Nothing can stop us from fulfilling our destiny. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for making us invincible, invulnerable. Hallelujah. Nobody can conquer us, Lord, because Jesus lives in us. Oh, God, we thank you that you bless us to be overcomers in this life. Hallelujah. In all circumstances, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen.